thesis. And today we're going to talk about the ones that primarily start with or involve problems in bioformation and bioflow, which are the cholestatic diseases. Um, and clearly, neither one is completely independent. They're both present in the liver. Bile flow is an integral part of what the hepatocytes do. But in general, you can categorize diseases on either side. It makes it a lot easier to put together your differential diagnosis. So the cholestatic diseases are ones where either bile isn't properly formed, and that's the primary problem. Clearly, you won't form bile if you get a viral hepatitis and wipe out all the hepatocytes. But this is where the primary problem is in the production of bile, or more commonly, actually, something blocking or impairing bile flow. So to think about these diseases, you have to, again, go through all of the places that bile travels. Because diseases in any one of those locations can cause uh, cholestasis impaired bile flow. From problems in the generation of bile at the canalicular membrane, the apical membrane of hepatocytes, through the tiny little uh, bile canaliculi, the small and larger <coughs> intrahepatic bile ducts, the ones that are in the portal tracts, and then the extrahepatic bile ducts all the way down to the sphincter of Odi, another one of those muscular sphincters, and the exit. Now the gallbladder hangs off to one side. Clearly, bile gets into the gallbladder, bile gets out of the gallbladder. But if you cut out the gallbladder or block its entrance, are you going to impair bile flow? No, it's a blind alley. So disease in the gallbladder, although it's important, and Grace Elta will talk to you about it, does not impinge on bile flow getting down to the intestine. So you can actually count, then break cholestatic liver disease into where is the problem. A problem with the level of the hepatocyte, a structural interference in the small intrahepatic bile ducts, or a structural anatomic interference with flow in the large and extrahepatic bile ducts all the way down to the intestine. And it just this helps you categorize diseases because they kind of fall into these groups. You can also define it by how you're identifying it. So biochemical cholestasis is the lab test. Increased alkaline phosphatase is the most reliable. If the diseases are severe enough or impair bile flow enough, you'll have an increased bilirubin. If you really blocked bile flow badly, then you get visible jaundice, very dark uh, Coca-Cola-colored urine, clay-colored stool because you don't get the pigments of bile into stool, and itching. But this is advanced disease where bile flow is markedly altered. The pathologists have findings that they see in the liver, and we'll take a look at some of those. You can get plugs of retained bile in the dilated canaliculi at the hepatocyte level. Some of that bile precipitates and, and forms a colored product inside the hepatocyte. If you bust and, and blow open some of these small ducts, you can get bile leaking out into the liver and causing some damage. And you can get infection in the bile ducts when they're clogged. Acute cholangitis, you'll probably see that. It's not that rare a problem. So how can you find, figure out cholestatic diseases? First of all, you have to be able to tell that cholestasis is present. And again, the alkaline phosphatase, plus minus bilirubin is your best bet. Looking at jaundice, the skin, the eyes, and funny changes in the <coughs> stool and the urine. Blood tests that we have can help us to also do that. Then, in order to establish the proof of the diagnosis, our tools are really twofold beyond blood tests. One is the liver biopsy to look. Look at the bile ducts, look at the liver cells, the little bile ducts. And the other is to look at all the rest of the bile ducts, the bigger bile ducts. And that's where we want to, we can use cross-sectional imaging, and we can inject dye, or with the MRI, magnetic resonance, you can use the bile as a contrast agent and see if there are strictures or stones or something sitting in the ducts. 
So a lot of the imaging studies help us out with these diseases. And it's always a question of do we go with the imaging studies first, do we go with the liver biopsy? It's a pretty simple workup once you finish the blood work. So this is again jaundice, very yellow sclery, a yellow tinge to the skin. Um, there is one other disease in the differential diagnosis of yellow looking palms, and that's hyperkeratinemia. This is people who are big juicers. They, they, they take vegetable juices, particularly carrot juice, in very, very large amounts. You have to really overdo it. Again, history is key here. So they look yellow, but their bilirubin is normal. Ask them about their carrot juice intake. Okay, this is a baby with a disease that presents with essentially complete bile duct obstruction at birth called biliary atresia. The extrahepatic bile ducts simply don't form. So they get very jaundiced, this uh, little baby is. You can see this is the urine, which is a really dark brown. Now, in renal, you also heard about hematuria, where there's blood in the urine, and it can look dark brown if it's been sitting there for a while. But you can also check the urine, and you can check it for blood versus bilirubin. This is bilirubin. Here are the little white clay-colored stools. They don't have a brown color because the pigment is all in the blood and the skin and the urine and not in the bowel. So let's talk about four different categories of diseases that can cause cholestasis. There are drugs and chemicals that can cause the liver just not to make bile. There's diseases of the small bile ducts up in the liver Clearly, any disease that wipes out liver cells can cause bilirubin to go up, but that's not really considered a cholestatic disease per se. And then there's the diseases that cause basically obstruction anywhere outside the liver. So you can block bile flow by blocking some of those transporters on the canalicular membrane of the hepatocyte. <laughs> and therefore, you don't excrete bilirubin and bile acids, and you don't make good bile flow, and you get cholestatic. And the two major ones are estrogens and endotoxin tumor necrosis factor. So this is a biopsy of a patient with severe <laughs> cholestasis. They were severely jaundiced. The alkaline phosphatase was elevated. This bilirubin could have been up around 30 or 35. And yet when you biopsy the liver, the hepatocytes all look perfectly normal. There's no white cells in there. The transaminases, if they're elevated, are trivially elevated. And what you see in all these hepatocytes is this brownish pigment that's retained biliary material. You're probably seeing it because it's bilirubin, but these cells would have a lot of bile acids in them and other things. And these are diseases that block these transporters. Remember, for bile acids, you have to take them up. They came up the portal vein from the ileum in here. You have a bile acid transporter that's ATP dependent. You have a bilirubin transporter that's ATP dependent. And it turns out that estrogen can inhibit these transporters, particularly the bilirubin. Um, so there is a disease of pregnancy called intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, and it's not important that you remember that, where the high estrogens of pregnancy in a genetically predisposed woman causes jaundice and itching. But the liver is actually otherwise normal. It can be reproduced in the people with the, with the appropriate genetic inheritance if you put them on high estrogen birth control pills. And I had a young woman referred to me in liver clinic. She was about 18, and she had developed some itching, and she had a bilirubin of about three, and her doctor sent her in to find out what her liver disease was. Her other liver tests were basically close to normal. And I was taking my history and asked her about medications and things, and she didn't have any. And then I said, is there any other pill you take? And she said, oh, yeah, here are my birth control pills. And we took her off the birth control pills, and her bilirubin went to normal, and she was fine. I said, if you get pregnant, you may well get jaundiced. <laughs> okay. 
Now, what you will see, <laughs> I know, it's a great prediction. Um, fortunately, it's not very important in terms of causing problems for the woman, although they can itch like crazy. Um, the one you're going to see in the hospital is sick patients with severe sepsis, especially gram-negative sepsis. These are often in the ICU, so it's been called ICU jaundice. And patients are septic. They've got bacteria running through them. They're having trouble controlling it. There's a lot of endotoxin that's being released. Endotoxin trashes this bilirubin transporter. We still don't know why, but it does a number. Bilirubin transport just stops cold. They can, have, they can be glowing yellow, bilirubin of 35. Now, their bile flow isn't quite normal because the bile acid transporter is also affected, but the main problem is this is just a defect in transport of bilirubin. You have to look for other liver diseases, but we're basically reassuring. The hepatologists are coming around reassuring everybody. Control the sepsis. Get the patient better. This too shall pass. Takes a while, but it does. Okay. In terms of what can you do to damage or destroy the small ducts up in the liver, you've got a disease called primary biliary cirrhosis, which Rich Mosley will also mention. In addition, if the tumor, if tumor or granulomas or something infiltrate into the liver and push <laughs> liver cells aside, they can cause compression of small bile ducts and some cholestasis. But let's look at primary biliary cirrhosis. This is a chronic, slowly evolving cholestatic disorder that primarily affects middle-aged women. It's a T-cell mediated destruction of intrahepatic bile ducts. So it's an autoimmune-ish type disease. And it slowly progresses to loss of bile ducts. That's the first thing. But you also then get scarring throughout the liver and they eventually get cirrhosis, but it's very late. So primarily they're cholestatic for many years. And because the hepatocytes aren't the primary point of, in, of injury, liver function remains preserved very, very late, much better than any other cause of cirrhosis. So this would be a typical laboratory test on somebody with advanced primary biliary cirrhosis. Now, I always have to explain to my patients when they come to see me because now we diagnose people who are not cirrhotic yet, and they may not be for a decade or two, the name of the disease is primary biliary cirrhosis. You do not have cirrhosis. This gets very confusing. It's because the disease is identified in very sick patients who already have cirrhosis. It got the name. We haven't changed the name. So this is an advanced case. You have a very high alkaline phosphatase, modest transaminases. This person still has good liver function they're still excreting their bilirubin because although they've, they've damaged and eliminated quite a few small bile ducts in the liver, which really sends the alkphos up, there's still a lot of bile ducts there that are doing their jobs perfectly well. Now, one of the common findings is a very high cholesterol. Remember, this is a cholestatic disease, and cholesterol is excreted into bile but if those ducts are damaged, it can reflux back into blood in a particle called lipoprotein X. Again, not important to remember that name. But the cholesterol can be very elevated, and yet it's not terribly um, heart unfriendly because it's in a lipoprotein. It's not in low-density lipoproteins. Antimitochondrial antibody is the antibody that is highly diagnostic or suggestive. There are about 5% of patients who don't have it, but 95% do. And because they're cholestatic and the liver is the source of getting rid of copper, their liver copper can be a little elevated. Doesn't <coughs> cause any problem that we know of, but it's a common feature. So here you're seeing the damage in this disease. Here's the hepatocytes out here looking perfectly happy. Only a one or two lymphocytes out here. They're not being destroyed. This is the portal tract. It's tremendously expanded with lots of lymphocytes. Here is a bile duct. These should be all nice little cuboidal, perfectly lined up cells, and they've been trashed. 
and you've got lymphocytes infiltrating in among the bile ducts, and you've got a lot of lymphocytes here, a few plasma cells, but a lot of lymphocytes. Here again is a high power of a portal tract with a ton of lymphocytes. Here's a bile duct that still looks pretty good, but there's a couple lymphocytes invading, and sooner or later, it's going to be eaten alive like that. Sometimes you will see granulomas in here as well, uh, but you often, you may not see them. So the clinical findings of the advanced disease, which is symptomatic, is jaundice, paritis, itching, and cholesterol deposits in the skin, xanthomas and xanthelasmas. Early on, all you have is an elevated alkaline phosphatase. So we pick these people up at an early stage in our automated testing where you send off a liver panel and you see an elevated alkaline phosphatase and you work them up and find out they have this disease. So again, we've got a jaundiced patient. This is the back of that patient. These are all excoriations from scratching. When people are deeply jaundiced and cholestatic, they itch like crazy. And we're still arguing about what are the peritogenic substances that aren't going out in bile. It's not all bile acids. There's other things. But wherever she can get, get there and scratch, she's got all these excoriations. Xanthelasmas are these deposits of cholesterol here around the eyes that give it a more light yellow color. And in some rare advanced cases, you actually get very large deposits of cholesterol around the skin. Now, in the days of statins, most of these people get put on high dose. It's not clear that their heart disease risk is all that much higher. It is a little bit. That helps to keep the cholesterol down. So you won't see this very often, but it can be very dramatic. Now, I mentioned that the other set of diseases inside the liver are the granulomatous or infiltrating diseases. If you have implants of tumor, if you have a disease, and we'll show you pictures called sarcoidosis. Do you hear about sarcoid in pulmonary? Okay. You can get sarcoidosis in the liver. There's big granulomas that form in the liver, but they're not really damaging hepatocytes. They're just pushing everything aside. You can also have infiltration from amyloidosis. By pushing the liver aside, you're compressing a lot of the little bile ducts and canaliculi, and you're causing a cholestatic process, even if you're not causing inflammation or injury. And so this is elevated alkaline phosphatase. It has to be pretty bad and pretty diffuse to cause jaundice. So elevated alkaline phosphatase may be the only sign by compression. And the two chief examples that we'll see, tuberculosis and sarcoid or metastatic tumor. So this is a picture of a liver biopsy in a patient with sarcoid. There's actually a central vein here. There's a portal tract here. There's some bile ducts. There's portal veins. And out in the parenchyma are these round globs, which are granulomas. And they're scattered randomly. They're not in any one particular spot. And that's sarcoid. Here's a picture here are nice hepatocytes and sinusoids. Here's this mixture of inflammatory cells. And you can actually see Langen's giant cells in there. But there's no caseation. So caseating granulomas are what you'd see in tuberculosis. These are non-caseating. And if you stain for fungi and TB, it's not there. So sarcoid's kind of a diagnosis. The, the granulomas are characteristic, but you do have to make sure that this isn't TB or a granulomatous fungal infection. Okay. So anything that infiltrates into the liver can cause a high alkphos, and it's technically cold stasis, but it's not really a liver disease. It's something taking up space and compressing. The biggest group of patients that you'll see are all the extrahepatic bile duct obstructions. And that's things that affect the bile ducts any place outside the liver all the way down to the intestine. And remember that the common bile duct goes through the head of the pancreas. You hear about pancreatic diseases next week. Anything in there 
except diseases in the gallbladder can cause, can block bile flow and cause problems. Partial obstruction, you get an elevated alkaline phosphatase. Complete obstruction, the bilirubin goes up also. So one of our tests for trying to look for obstruction is ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. This is done with an endoscope. Here's the endoscope, went down the stomach, out the duodenum, and here's the ampulla of Vater. And then there's, it's a side viewing endoscope with a channel you can then send out a little catheter and try to cannulate in there. Now, this takes a while to learn to do. Um, and then inject dye to retrograde fill the ducts and see if there's a problem. So here's the endoscope. <coughs> the ampulla of Vater's right about here. The catheter's there. And you're seeing nice, slender, bile, common bile duct. You're seeing the intrahepatic ducts on the left and the right. This squiggly thing is the cystic duct. It has valves in it, so it looks like it's twisted, even though it isn't. And then dye is in the gallbladder. You can also inject the pancreatic duct and look at the pancreas. Now, once we figured out how we could get into this area, everybody wanted to be able to do something. So now there's tools that you can help treat some of these problems using the endoscope without surgery. And Grace Elta will talk to you about some of that uh, next week. Now, the only problem with ERCP is you're messing around where the pancreatic duct comes out. And as uh, Michelle Anderson will tell you next week, the pancreas is a really touchy organ. And when it gets annoyed, it can make people very sick. So there is a risk of setting off a pancreatitis when you're in that area and messing with the ducts. And there, that is a risk of this procedure. So we try to use ERCP nowadays more for therapy and see if there are other ways of making a diagnosis that are less invasive. So we talked about the fact that if you tie off the common the cystic duct or remove the gallbladder, that does not cause jaundice. The system is completely open. So the, high, the superhighway is fine. The subdivision out here got taken <laughs> offline, but that doesn't give you jaundice. All right. So there are things that can happen inside the bile duct that can block it. There are things that happen outside the bile duct that can block it. You've got intrinsic obstruction. You've got gallstones, which you'll hear about from Grace Elta. You can have strictures after prior surgery. There's a disease I'll show you called primary sclerosing cholangitis. You can get things crawling into the bile duct. And if you have a fistula in the liver between sinusoids and a bile duct, you can get blood going down the bile ducts, and that can clot. You can have anything that's around the bile duct, if it grows, can compress this fairly small structure. So tumor is the really big one. Pancreatic is the largest group. Pancreatic cancer is fairly common. And the, the last couple inches of the common bile duct is through the head of the pancreas. So if you have a cancer there, it can easily squeeze shut that pancreatic duct. Cholangiocarcinoma is cancer of the bile ducts. A lymphoma or a metastatic tumor uh, right in the hilum of the liver, right around where the ducts are coming out, could do it. If you have inflammation or scarring in the pancreas from acute or chronic pancreatitis, those that can also narrow down and compress the bile duct. And there are these congenital diseases of biliary atresia where it never forms and a cystic structure that partially blocks bile flow, a cholidocal cyst. So let me talk about primary sclerosing cholangitis. It is the male equivalent of primary biliary cirrhosis. So you can have, men and women can have both, but it's not equal opportunity. The vast majority of patients with primary biliary cirrhosis are women. The majority of people with primary sclerosing cholangitis are men, and we don't know why yet. So it's a slowly evolving disease with fibrosis, stricturing, and inflammation 
that particularly affects the extrahepatic bile ducts. It can affect the ones up in the liver as well, but this is the classic. Primarily, you're going to see it in adult to middle-aged men, and there is a very high association with ulcerative colitis. Now, if you do a Venn diagram, ulcerative colitis is like this, and PSC is like this. So most people with ulcerative colitis do not ever get PSC. But of the people with PSC, more than half of them will have ulcerative colitis. It may be very mild. It may not yet have been diagnosed. So it is routine that we see, when we see a patient who we think has primary sclerosis and cholangitis, we say, congratulations, welcome to the world of colonoscopy. Because we're going to do a colonoscope, colonoscopy, and we're going to biopsy their mucosa and see if they even have very mild ulcerative colitis. It's such a high probability. Complications include complete duct obstruction with jaundice. Then you can get infection in the above the obstructed areas, cholangitis. You can itch. They can also get cholangiocarcinoma. Again, the liver cells are relatively well preserved, so liver function continues pretty well even very late into this disease. So typical abnormalities here are just like the ones I showed you for primary biliary cirrhosis. <coughs> High alkaline phosphatase when the disease is very well established and has been there a long time. They tend to get jaundiced a little early because they get physical obstruction of the main bile duct. And all you have to do is do one tight stricture in the middle of the common bile duct and somebody can get fairly jaundiced. Transaminase is modestly elevated. Eventually, they will develop cirrhosis and may develop liver failure, but that's very late. You're usually dealing with jaundice and bile duct strictures long before that. Typical clinical findings are bile duct obstruction, best seen on imaging of the ducts. Um, if they have complete obstruction, you may see jaundice and the ducts upstream of the obstruction dilate. Because this is a disease of the lower down large ducts, up in the liver on a biopsy, you may see that bile plugs exist there, but you may see little breaks in the bile ducts with bile leaking out into the parenchyma. And above the obstructed areas, if bacteria get in there, you can get acute cholangitis, which can become systemic. People present very sick, high fevers, very sick. Eventually, they can develop cirrhosis. So on liver biopsy, there aren't a lot of typical classic findings because this is primarily a disease below the liver. But you can see this ring and rings of fibrosis. This is an intrahepatic bile duct, but this is a trichrome stain. So you don't see the individual cells very well, and they're a deep purpley red. So these are the cuboidal epithelial cells. They actually look pretty good but you've got rings of this onion skinning fibrosis. That can be a clue. It's not proof, but it's a clue. The proof here is to do the ERCP. So this is a normal one. Here's the scope. This is the nice pancreatic duct going out here, the nice bile duct going up here, very smooth, et cetera. Okay. And it looks abnormal, but let's look at this. So when bile ducts are obstructed, what happens to the bile? It backs up, and if this goes on for a period of time, the bile ducts will dilate. Again, think of the stricture like a dam in a river. What's upstream dilates. So when you're looking for is there a complete obstruction of one or more bile ducts that's been present for a while, Look for dilation of bile ducts upstream with a narrowed area below. So this is sclerosis and cholangitis. Let's see if we can make this a little bit darker. So here's the nice normal duct. It's a little plumpish, but it's fine. Here you've got the scope down here. This is the catheter going in. 
and you've got dilated areas, you've got narrow areas. You've got dilated areas, narrow areas, dilated, narrow. This chain of lakes appearance is the classic late stage PSC. We look for a milder version in earlier cases where you have narrowed areas and then usually dilated upstream. Multiple ones is very classic because this is hits the bile duct at multiple points. Now, sometimes you can see bile duct obstruction in a cross-sectional imaging study if a number of bile ducts are really widely dilated. And um, this is a CT scan of the liver. Uh, stomach's over here with some oral contrast. Spleen's over here. Here's the liver. Now, contrast was given in the vein, so you can see the aorta and a little bit of the vena cava. These white things are branches of the portal vein. Remember, the bile ducts run parallel to the vein in the portal tracts. So right next to the portal vein, you have these black tubular structures. Those are markedly dilated bile ducts. You're seeing them both in the left lobe and the right lobe, so you know someplace downstream, there's a complete high-grade obstruction. This CT doesn't tell you where that is, although you might be able to do cuts following the bile duct down and get an idea, but it tells you there's a high-grade complete obstruction someplace. And because it's affecting both lobes of the liver, it has to be after the left and right hepatic duct come together. So it's from that point down to the intestine is where you're going to find your disease. You can also get a dilated bile uh, by, uh, gallbladder. If the gallbladder is really dilated, where is the obstruction? <coughs> it's below the cystic duct entrance. If you're above the cystic duct entrance and obstruct the bile duct, then you have ducts in the liver that dilate, but the gallbladder will probably be shrunken down. So in this case, you know the obstruction is below where the cystic duct comes into the common bile duct. And here you've got cross sections of those dilated ducts right next to a white portal vein. But you cut down further. This is the body and the tail of the pancreas. Here's a big mass in the head of the pancreas. This is going to be a pancreatic cancer causing obstruction of the distal common bile duct. If you look up, if you happen to have a liver biopsy, and we don't do these very often anymore because we, we can figure the problems out, you may see retained bile in bile ducts up in the liver, and you may see bile that's kind of leaked out into the parenchyma. Again, here's a portal tract. You've got a portal vein. You've got a thick-walled hepatic artery. You've got a couple of ratty-looking bile ducts here. This is bile lakes and retained bile fluid out in the parenchyma in the liver. Acute cholangitis, this is not our preferred way of making the diagnosis. We should like to do it by knowing the patient has a cholestatic liver disease and they're febrile and they're septic. Um, but if you happen to get a, a biopsy at that time, these are bile ducts up in the liver, and what's in the middle of them are polymorphonuclear leukocytes. You shouldn't have polys in the lumen of your bile duct. That means you got a bad infection. So what other things can cause obstruction? Um, this is lymphoma, because there are lymph nodes right around the bifurcation of the bile duct. Pancreatic cancer, ampullary cancer, something like that down here can do it. Um, you can have stones in the gallbladder, and one of them comes down here and obstructs right above the, um, the sphincter of Odi. Again, the narrowest area is the sphincter of Odi. It's amazing how big a gallstone can make it through that cystic duct sometimes. And then they impact here, and somebody comes in jaundiced. You can, if you have chronic pancreatitis in the head of the pancreas with fibrosis that slowly squeeze that distal duct, that can also cause obstruction. When the obstruction is partial, what lab test will be elevated? Alkfas. 
To get the bilirubin to go up, you have to have either an extremely high-grade obstruction, so bile just can't really get through very well, or a complete obstruction. And here's a high-grade cholangiocarcinoma at the in the hilum of the liver, right at that bifurcation. It's called a Klatskin's tumor after Joe Klatskin. So here's the ERCP scope. Here is actually dye in the distal bile duct, which is perfectly normal. And then you've got a very thread-like narrowed area here. It's narrowed on the left and right branch. And then you have this big dilated duct upstream on both sides. So you know the very end of the duct is open. So there's something in this area that's compressing it symmetrically. And cholangiocarcinoma is one of the things that can do that. And it's just one area of obstruction. So this is the biliary equivalent of the apple core lesion in the colon. You're seeing the tiny narrow lumen because it's a circumferential tumor. You can also get high-grade obstruction if you have masses in the lymph nodes outside the liver and up in the liver. This is somebody who had a metastatic rectal carcinoma. And there's a big metastasis here, but there's also some lower down around the hilum. So you have dilated bile ducts, these black tubular structures in both the left and right lobes. And it was metastases in the lymph nodes below. But you also had one up here. Again, cholangiocarcinoma. This is somebody with a high alk FOS. Somebody. Um, who has a bilirubin of 17. And again, you see the ERCP scope here. You see the little catheter going up in the bile duct and injecting dye. You see a nice distal bile duct. And then this very narrow area, which is the cholangiocarcinoma, and dilated duct upstream. Now, we can open up some of these strictures with tumors. You can put a stent in there. There are these. So you probably heard about stents in cardiology. I can't imagine you didn't hear about stents. So these self-expanding mesh, metal mesh stents can be made in any size for any tube. So we have ones for the biliary tree. These are clearly larger than from the coronary artery. And they're collapsed, and you can push them in over a guide wire, and then you put a balloon on the inside and open them up, and the, the mesh locks into position and holds there. So you can relieve obstruction to relieve symptoms, prevent cholangitis, and other things in patients with malignant strictures. And we can do that with the ERCP scope. Here's a plastic stent, which can be put in very easily, but they clog and have to be changed. Here's a metal mesh stent that's likely, it's much wider, it's much more likely to stay open and provide good drainage long term. And you know what these little things are? Those are metal sutures. And so this patient had a surgical procedure someplace that had metal sutures put in. Okay. This is chronic pancreatitis where you've got the scope in, and you're injecting, and it's the end of the common bile duct as well as here the end of the pancreatic duct that are both obstructed. So if you're going to obstruct both the pancreatic duct and the bile duct, you have to locate the problem right down here in the head of the pancreas, and pancreatic cancer is the most likely cause. Clearly, there could be other things. A big cancer of the ampulla would do it also. This is somebody whose gallbladder was winning the Guinness Book of Records for making gallstones, and they all went into the common bile duct. And this is somebody who's got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, at least 20, and there's probably a lot more gallstones in there. So you've injected dye which gives you the white contrast. The stones are made of cholesterol. And so you're seeing them in negative outline by the dye that's going percolating around them. And so this person probably had high alkaline phosphatase 
If a stone impacts hard down at the end, then they'll get jaundice. It's amazing, though, that sometimes bile trickles past all of this and still gets through. So we can then cut open the end of that and pull out those gallstones and fix it. Um, we talked to you about these large dilated bile ducts. You can also see them out in the periphery. You can see that on imaging. It tells you there's a blockage. It doesn't tell you from this picture where that is. This is an unusual cause of obstruction. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this actually is a T-tube. It's, this person had had some surgery, and there was a tube put in, and the bile duct was sewn together around it, and this tube comes to the outside world. And when dye was injected, you see a long tubular structure here inside the bile duct. Here the dye has leaked out into the duodenum, so you're seeing all the little folds. That was worms, ascariasis. They apparently like to crawl in through the ampulla and up into bile. Now they carry with them their own gut. The skin and the gut of the worm is not sterile. So what complication might this patient develop? Well, jaundice, if it's completely obstructed, infection, cholangitis. Bile is sterile until a foreign body that's not sterile is introduced. <laughs> so this person may have prevent, presented with cholangitis, and then you're trying to figure out why. And that's one for all those who love parasitology and its yick factor. OK. So what are the consequences of cholestasis when you get it? Clearly, you have a high alk phos, you can be jaundiced, you can be itching. But there are other secondary problems that occur if you really have major reduction in bile flow over a long period of time. You get a secondary biliary cirrhosis. The bile acids tend to get retained in the liver. They are detergents. They actually cause liver damage. And over time, you get a secondary biliary cirrhosis. So you don't want somebody going around, even if they're not jaundiced, they have a high alkaline phosphatase, they can get, over the years, a secondary biliary cirrhosis. You also have problems in that you may not have things getting into the gut. And that would be you might get enough defect in bile acids getting there that you get fat-soluble vitamin malabsorption and fat malabsorption. But this is severe cholestasis over a long period of time. In this country, we usually find people and treat them sooner than that. But if it's a disease that people didn't come in and see a doctor and they were at home with for years, this can gradually develop. So in summary, for the evaluation of cholestasis or jaundice, you suspect cholestasis based on the history physical exam and lab tests. You look for clues to mechanical obstruction of ducts and mass lesions. You try to visualize, diagnosis, and treat mechanical obstruction. And for intrahepatic cholestasis, we often need a liver biopsy. And when Dr. Alhawari comes back next week, he's talking about cross-sectional imaging. He'll also show you some MRI pictures that can help us see the bile ducts as well. OK, we'll take a break and then hear about chronic liver diseases. <laughs>